It's good to be back uh, in the Church of Praise. I always uh, enjoy coming here because you are such a wonderful, responsive uh, group of people. And of course, very friendly too. Say something la. <laughs> uh, okay. <clears throat> Today we are at the Galatians chapter 1. Part of your scheduled uh, series in uh, going through the Bible. I think it's a wonderful thing to be able to preach uh, from the Bible and go through it so that the people of God can know what the Word of God is saying. Uh, because while we, are, we can be blessed very much through topical sermons, uh, yet it is always good to go through the whole Bible because a lot of Christians don't read the Bible. True or not? Very true. Especially Old Testament. Even my Bible school students, ah, you know, long ago, we used to assume that when people say that, oh, I want to be a pastor, then they come to Bible school, they will at least have read the whole Bible. But nowadays, it's not so. People come, you know, they want to be a pastor, but when I teach Old Testament, they look at me like, you know, like, oh, that, that story? Oh, God, God, God is, is in the Bible, ah? you know? Uh, so now... Uh, when we receive students, we make it a point whereby we say, please read the entire Bible before you come. That bad, no? really bad. <clears throat> but this is a wonderful thing your church is doing, going through the whole Bible. So let's read from Galatians. I'm going to just read from verse 3 onwards until verse 17. From the NIV version. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you by the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we, or an angel from heaven, should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let that person be under God's curse. As we have already said, so now I say again, if anybody is preaching to you, a gospel rather than what you accepted. Let the person be under God's curse. Am I trying to win human approval or God's approval? Or am I trying to please people? If I were try still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. I want you to know, brothers, that the gospel I preach is not of human origin. I did not receive it from any human source, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my previous way of life in Judaism, how intensely I persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people and was extremely zealous for the traditions of my fathers. But when God, who has set me apart from birth and called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles, my immediate response was not to consult any human being. I did not go up to Jerusalem to see those who were apostles before I was, but I went to Arabia and later I returned to Damascus. Let's pray. Father, this morning we ask that this letter written by Paul to the Christians in Galatia, that its importance and its relevance may be made real to us. Speak to our hearts. Feed your people. We ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Some scholars entitled the book of Galatians, uh, the theme, uh, or the main message of Galatians, as a spiritual health check. So I basically took that, uh, uh, the, those words uh, from some of those scholars. It is considered a spiritual health check because the, the book of Galatians uh, actually tells us to, uh, or let us know, if there's something wrong in our life. Just like when people go for a health check, you know, uh, there are usually two reasons. Well, the first reason is to find out your health condition, see if there are uh, anything wrong with, with you or, or how healthy you are. Another reason people do 
health check is uh, when they already know something is wrong and then they want to know how seriously wrong uh, or how seriously ill someone is. So those are the two reasons. Galatians can function in both ways. It can tell us, you know, how healthy you are. It can even tell you if you have any symptoms of uh, any uh, spiritual illness. At the same time, it also functions the other way, whereby if a person is, you know, going out of the, the, the true faith, it also tells you how sick you are. Uh, but for that, we will leave it to the other speakers, especially when you go to the later chapters. This morning, as an introduction, you find that the way Paul write this letter, if you have also read some of his other letters, is actually quite different. This letter is a bit more direct, more emotional. In no other letters of Paul does he ever you know, react so strongly, whereby he says that if anybody ever do that, let him be cursed or under God's curse. Now, those are very strong words. You translate it into modern day uh, speech, it will be, let him go to hell. <gasps> How can a Christian leader, especially apostle, tell people to go to hell? So ungodly, isn't it? You should say something so gentle, uh, a bit more gentle. But you know, Paul is a... I think you, when you go to heaven, besides meeting Jesus and all your relatives and uh, family, the, the other person you should meet is Paul. Just look at him and see what kind of a guy he is. He is the kind of guy is that I think if he is not safe, you wouldn't like him very much. <laughs> uh, as you can see from the book of Acts, you know, he doesn't mind throwing people into prison if, you don't, if he doesn't agree with uh, what you believe in. He doesn't even mind killing you. Uh, like the way he witnessed and uh, sort of uh, sup, uh, uh, oversee the, st the stoning of Stephen. He, he's that kind of guy, actually quite bad. You know? And uh, he's very good at arguing. If you look at his letters, you know that he can argue very well uh, and actually have very logical points. At the same time, he's a guy who tells you, what is love? First Corinthians chapter 13. Love is kind. <laughs> Love doesn't keep a record of wrongs. <laughs> and then you look at Paul. Are you real or not? Uh, he is like so con a man of contradiction, of, you know, very strong character, uh, can be nasty if he really wants to be. But after he's saved, you know, you, you see another side of Paul, you know, the, the side that is loving and kind and and actually sometimes to the point of being sweet. But in Galatians, you see the sweetness and the, and the strong character coming together and are struggling in the tension. So he starts off and he, you can see he's very upset. As you uh, go back and read Galatians chapter 1, you can see that he's really so upset and sarcastic as well. I am astonished that you so quickly depart from the faith that you have received. You know, that kind of thing. Uh, that's why if he's not safe, you wouldn't like to be around Paul. When he's sarcastic, he really can cut you to the bone, that kind of guy. But for this kind of a person, he also has one very good part in his character, and that is when he believes in something, he gives 100% to it. He is never sleep short, half-hearted, you know, the kind of like can, cannot, with the, all the... Um, BM, uh, Malay, Bahasa Malaysia word, Tita Appa. He, he's never, he don't have the Tita Appa attitude. For him, is he's very passionate. If he believes in something, he gives himself wholeheartedly to it. Then we need to ask is, what is it that is causing Paul to be so upset that he used such strong language, you know, tell people to go to hell. That, that is really like, how can the Paul who talk about love, uh, you know, talk like that? Because even among Christians today, we always feel like, as a Christian, you should be kind, loving, sweet, gentle, you know, uh, and uh, a lot of endurance. Uh, so some people think that as a Christian, you shouldn't get angry. Mm. Uh, I just recently heard you know, from someone who was telling me that, you know, he, he's actually a, 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 a boss, <clears throat> all right, and he has uh, workers under him and... Uh, Basically, he helps, he does things uh, for uh, renovation and things like that. Okay. And uh, every time he get angry with his workers, the workers who are non-Christians will say, Boss, you just became a Christian. Eh? You cannot get angry. And so he was like, 
<laughs> he was really struggling. So he came and do some work for our house in Ipoh. And then my, he was talking to my sister. And then my sister, you know, said to me like, oh, you, this guy, uh, he became a Christian now, but he's struggling, you know, because every time he's upset with his workers, uh, his worker was telling me, boss, you're a Christian already, uh? Uh, So I told my sister, I said, why don't you tell him? Because he's going to come back and do the work again. I said, why don't you tell him? He uh, asked him to respond this way to his workers. He says that being a Christian does not mean you cannot get angry. Because there are things, when they are wrong, we should be upset. If things go wrong also, you don't get upset. Then how are you going to rectify the situation? All right. Anger by itself is not a sin. But anger that is not controlled, that become abusive, that cause you to respond in a way that hurt people and do wrong things, that is wrong. But anger itself is not wrong. Do you know that Jesus get angry? That's why, you know, he took a whip and uh, chased out the people from the temple of God who were selling things uh, at a terrible price and actually, you know, uh, ripping off people who come to the, the temple to give sacrifice and they have to buy from the temple because they cannot bring, you know, all, all their animals there. And so the people were just ripping off those people, the worshippers, because you have to buy from us, monopoly. And so they charge a very high price. And Jesus took a whip and <laughs> whipped them out, says you are robbers. Gee, when Jesus gets angry, you don't play player, huh? Yeah, you don't play, play you know, because he is God. Do you know that when God is angry, uh, the, in the Old Testament it says the wrath of God, all right, he actually kills entire nations. Uh, that's why there's judgment. Uh, so don't play with God. But it's just that when we, the, the, the face of God that we see now is loving, kind, sweet, you know, the blue eye Jesus, you know, golden hair, one long, long, and then the hair got a shine one, like then they use Pantene shampoo one, <laughs> you know, ah, and then he always carry a lamb, you know, with loving eyes looking at the lamb, so there's, we all think of Jesus like that, but actually that is not the real thing, la. our Jesus is not like that, the Bible says that our God Actually, in the Old Testament, especially like in Nehemiah, it says that uh, modern day version try to soften it a bit and use the word awesome. Our God is an awesome God. So we say, ha. Ah. But actually, the real word is terrible. The original meaning is terrible. Terrible means from the word terrifying. Not terrible as in bad, you know, but like from the word, he's a terrifying God. That is why. Angels, demons, they all tremble before God. Because when you stand before Him or when you're in His presence, automatically, without God doing anything, even when He's not angry with you, you just have the sense of terror, of fear. That's why the Old Testament used to say, fear of God, fear of God. Because it's an automatic kind of fear, you know, that comes upon you. But it's just that now that, you know, God saves us and... Um, want us to know how much he loves us. So all we, when we come and think of God or see God, we think of him as sweet, gentle, you know, kind, loving, uh, forgiving, merciful, all the wonderful side. We don't see the other side. But actually the other side is that. It's very real. It's, very, it's just that it's not directed to us. His terrifying aspect is not directed to us because he chose to make us his children. So he treats us as a, fa as a father would treat his children. But God really is a terrifying God. Or else, who do you think created hell? Hell is created by God, not by Satan. That's why Satan is not even, is nowhere near when it comes to, you know, the, how, ter how terrifying he is. Nowhere near God. But that actually makes us love God even more. To know that this God that is so terrifying that not, no living thing can actually stand in his presence. He chose to relate to us as a father. Whereby, you know, in the, in the New Testament it says that Jesus has opened a new and living way. So that we can come before God with confidence. This is what God has done for us. But... The gospel, which is, that's why actually gospel means good news. The good news is that God has done so much for us so that 
in spite of the fact that we who are sinners should not be able to come into His presence, God make it possible. But God make it possible through what means? Through a very s- simple means. So simple until there are a lot of people who can't accept it. How do you get saved? How do you enter into the presence of God? How do you get saved? Huh? Gather in Jesus' name, but sim- the, the first time you got saved, how do you get saved? Yala, you accept the Lord. How do you accept the Lord? How do you accept the Lord? I know this is not a class, but hey, you need to get this right because it's so simple. You just believe, isn't it? Huh? You just say, oh, I, I accept the Lord. Why? Because you say, I, want, I, I believe in Jesus. That's all. But because it is so simple, it actually becomes quite like uh, unbelievable. Like how can something so great, you know, like enter the presence of this terrifying, you know, God who actually, you know, uh, is so awesome and so powerful. And then how do you come in? Oh, oh just by, uh, I believe in Jesus. Oh, so simple. How can it be? You must surely need to do a lot of things, you know, to get rid of your sin, do a lot of things to make yourself acceptable and uh, gain his approval. You know, like coming before, you know, a great king, you know, and then just trying to gain audience, you know, you have to like bring how many, uh, all those very precious, important gifts, like expensive gifts, like maybe give him, don't know, a Rolls Royce, like whatever, just to gain audience. Huh? Only just believe. But that is what the gospel is. That's why it's called good news. It's very simple. But because it's so simple, there are people who actually refuse to accept the fact that it's so simple. So for the Galatians, they faced that kind of situation. Paul came, preached to them, and said, believe in Jesus and you'll be saved. Oh, by the grace of God, you're saved. Oh, they're so happy. Then after that, Paul left Galatia, uh, the the city there, and then uh, went to another place to preach. The moment he left, there was a group of people, they are Jews, uh, who will come. And these Jews are obviously Christians because if they are not Christians, they wouldn't even bother to talk to Christians. So they are, they, they are Christians. But you see, because they were Jews, Jews, are all males are circumcised because this is the seal that God has given to Abraham in the Old Testament whereby a Jewish male must always be circumcised. This is a seal of God's covenant with the Jewish nation. So they felt that, yes, we have believed in Jesus and uh, we are saved, but, you know, we must still keep the certain things, like, for example, circumcision. We must keep that seal. And so out of the good intention of their heart, uh, hear this, good intention, they felt that Paul was not preaching the complete gospel. And so what they do is they would follow Paul. Every time, you know, I don't know how they do it in those days, no internet, no telephone and all that, but somehow they know where Paul is, and after, then they make sure that after Paul left, uh, they don't want to do it when Paul is around because they cannot out-argue Paul. After Paul left, they would go and visit the church. And then they would come and say, oh, we are also Christian. Oh, we are Christians. Of course, uh, many of the Galatian Christians are Gentiles. That means they are not Jews. And then they would come and say, oh, we are Jewish Christians. You know, we receive the Lord. By the way, do you know that uh, Jesus is, all, was, is also a Jew? And that the God that you have now received through in Jesus Christ is actually our God. You know, he is the God of our uh, uh, scriptures. And so, you know, and then they will be able to say a lot of things to impress the Galatian Christians because Galatian Christians don't know a lot of scriptures, but all these Jewish Christians would know much more. And after a while, they will say that, well, you believe in Jesus, that's wonderful, but, you know, you need one more thing, and that is circumcision. Because if you are not circumcised, you don't have that seal that God made with Abraham. So all of you must be circumcised. When Paul heard that, he was really upset and he wrote this letter. And he says, you know, you receive the gospel, the good news that we preach to you. Now you are believing another gospel. And Paul says that any other gospel, even if an angel come and reveal it to you that is different from the one we originally preached, let that person go to hell. Now why is Paul so upset? After all, you know, just an additional thing, you know, that those Jewish Christians are not telling you don't believe in Jesus. They are saying, yes, yes, believe in Jesus, but just you need something more. Why just that something more caused Paul to be so upset? It is because Paul says 
the way to salvation is only be by believing in Jesus Christ and nothing else. You know why that is so important? Let me tell you or ask you. How did sin enter the world? Sorry, like another theology class. How did sin enter the world? Adam and Eve. Disobedience. What kind of disobedience? Uh, now, go back to Adam and Eve. So, what happened? Come on. Yes, they ate the fruit that they are not supposed to eat. Now, how did that happen? Well, uh, most of you would know the story. The serpent come and, uh, came and talked to Eve and asked, uh, you know, did God say uh, you cannot eat any of the fruit uh, in this garden? And Eve says, uh, no, 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 no. Uh, only one fruit, all right, the fruit of the tree, from the tree of uh, knowledge of good and evil. All other fruit we can eat. But this fruit we cannot eat because the moment we eat it, we will die. And the serpent told Eve, responded, he replied, No, you eat, you won't die. In fact, when you, after you eat it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God. Now, just go back and think about the situation. So Eve heard what the serpent said. Eve says, the, we, it, God says we eat, we'll die. Serpent said, No, you eat, you won't die. And you know, the fruit is actually very, very good. Makes you even better than now. And so Eve turned her eyes and looked at the fruit. Wow, looks good. Huh? Perhaps that fruit may be even more attractive than any other fruit, better than durian. Of course, those of you who don't like durian, I mean, uh, for us, it's like, ah, oh, there's no other fruit better than durian, you know. Ah, oh, so fragrant. Of course, some people say toilet smell. Never mind. Okay, ah, oh, it's so fragrant, you know. Uh, but there's no fruit that smells like this fruit. There's no fruit that looks like this fruit. It's so attractive. And so she took and she ate. After she ate, did she die? She didn't die. You see, most likely, after she ate already, you know, I don't feel any different. I don't feel, you know, like, you know, I'm dying or I'm sick or, you know, uh, I, I don't feel any different. I, I, I'm just, I feel as good as before. So, she went to her husband, Adam, and says, eat. Now, of course, the Bible doesn't tell all this because the Bible, you know, always reduced the story to just the badges. But you can imagine, Adam would say, what? Hey, that fruit you can't eat. God says you eat, you die. Why did you eat it? And Eve would say, I ate already. I didn't die. Look, I'm still fine. And so, Adam also believed and took the fruit and ate. Men believe their wives. At that time, now they don't. <laughs> you see, there's a problem with sin. All the good things that we lost. Actually, all the men believe what well, the women want, but now, <laughs> yeah, sad. <clears throat> but anyway, so, basically, how did sin enter the world? If heard from God, you shouldn't eat. You eat, you die. Then she heard from Satan or the serpent, you eat, you won't die. In fact, you become better. So she has to decide who to believe because it's one person's word versus another. There's nothing, no evidence to see whether you die or you don't die. Uh, so she decided to believe the serpent's word and disbelieve God's word. That's how sin entered the world. But did Eve die or not? Did Adam die or not? They did. It's just that death did not happen instantly. It's not like poison you eat and immediately you die. Death began. They lost the glory of God. And decay came into the human body. Actually, we were supposed to be like God. That means we are not supposed to die. We are meant to live forever. Human beings are meant to live forever. We are supposed to be beautiful and healthy and great forever because that's what God is. We are made in the image of God. But the moment they eat the fruit, death sets in. That's why today we get old. Old is actually a sign of decay, you know. Do you know that? Your body is running down. All right. And uh, health problems come in. No matter how healthy you once were when you were young, health problems begin to set in. 
and then we die. And now death is a reality. Nobody escapes death. And it all started with someone who doesn't believe in God's word. That is why today salvation, how is it done? What is the means to salvation? Believing God's word. You know, this is the Sunday after Easter. Thomas, who did not see the resurrected Christ, the first time Jesus appeared to his disciples, you know, says that I will not believe unless I see and touch his hands. So Jesus appeared to him. And the moment Jesus appeared, of course, then Thomas believed. And he said, my Lord, my God. But you know what Jesus says? It's good that you believe now, but blessed are those who did not see and believe. We are the people who have not seen, did not see, and believed. That's why blessed are we. Because we are people who have chosen to believe in God's word. That if you believe in Jesus Christ, you will be saved. For as many as re- to those who receive him, God gave you authority and power to become the children of God. We have believed that. And today we receive the authority and the power to become the children of God. And all of this is made possible just because by believing. Because by believing God's word, you reverse the curse of sin. The sin that came, the curse of sin, the curse of death that came into the human race was due to unbelief. It's not because they did something bad. You know, they killed somebody, you know, they they robbed somebody. Adam and Eve didn't kill anyone. They didn't rob anyone. They didn't do anything that harm anybody. Sin came because... They didn't believe. And today, you and I, we, because we believe in Jesus Christ, believe that he died on the cross and that he, his death on the cross can take away all our sins. Did we see? We didn't see. We just believe. Believe the word of God that is now passed to us through generations. That is why we are blessed and we are saved. Because the sin, the power of sin, the curse of sin has been reversed in our lives. But you see, the the physical evidence is not there yet. Just like Eve and Adam, when they ate the fruit, did they start to immediately, you know, just die? No, there was no physical evidence of death. But death already was, was, has already set in. And so you see in the book of Genesis, human beings can actually live for hundreds of years, but their lifespan gets shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter. Because that, those, that is the work of the physical work of decay. Today, when you believe in Jesus Christ, do you see physical evidence of eternal life? No. Isn't it? It's not like, oh, I believe in Jesus Christ and, you know, I become prettier. <laughs> Sorry, like, that will never happen. You know, smarter, you know, more successful. No, no, no. No physical evidence. In fact, man, for... We, even though we believe that there are miracles and they are, but those are few and far in between. You know? Most people, when they are sick, they believe in Jesus, they are still sick and some of them even die. Isn't it? All right? And those people who are not so smart still remain not so smart. No. Physic, you, if you ask for physical evidence, you, you don't see much. In fact, you know, Blessed are those, uh, you know, when you receive Christ, all of a sudden you experience something inside, you know. Uh, maybe a kind of a release or a kind of a, uh, you know, touch from the Lord. And uh, some people even cry and all that. Well, that is a good thing. But, you know, for some, mo- quite a lot of people, they actually don't feel anything. Man. That's why it's actually not very good to ask people, like, you know, after you've led them in the sinner's prayer, you know, how do you feel? Don't ask. Because what if they say, nothing and then, the, why, the reason I say don't ask is that you make them feel that they are lacking something. That, oh, you know, am I supposed to feel something? So now I don't feel anything, uh, something wrong, isn't it? not real, isn't it? Or maybe God hasn't forgiven me yet because I don't feel. No, no, no. Oftentimes, the physical side, you, you, you can't see much of it. You can't see the change. You don't see like, Tung, I become son of God, you know, a seal there. <laughs> no lah. Some feel something, but a lot of people don't feel anything. Because even though you say that, oh, I received Jesus Christ, now I have eternal life, I'm now a a, a child of God, and I have been uh, translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. But, you know, I would, nothing, still the same. But just because you don't feel anything, you don't see anything, does it mean nothing happened? 
That's why it's important to know the Old Testament, my friend. You look at Adam and Eve, nothing happened. Really nothing happened. Slowly, the evidence is there. They felt naked. It didn't happen immediately. And then slowly, the decay of sin came in generation upon generation. In a similar way, eternal life has started in each of us. It's going to culminate and be revealed when you leave this world and see Jesus face to face. Your body is going to be like the resurrected Christ, whereby it has some similarity with your old body and yet completely different. Because I don't want my old body. Uh, I would first thing tell God, God, I want a better body. Uh, in the sense that people will recognize who you are, but your body will be different. It will be a body, you know, like Jesus, whereby you can, in the twinkling of an eye, appear in a room that is closed. Wouldn't that be fun? Better than Star Trek. You don't have to say, beam me up, Scotty. I don't know whether they still do that. Okay. You know, you can go anywhere in the twinkling of an eye. I imagine one day we can go from star to star traveling in the twinkling of an eye. Use your imagination. Uh, that's what, you know, that is going to, because God can do that. Right? So we will be able to do that. And uh, your resurrected body will no longer suffer decay. You will no longer be sick. And uh, you don't have to worry about, worry about cholesterol, uh, uh, hypertension, uh, that kind of thing. You can eat and eat and eat and don't have to worry. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> because the resurrected Christ ate, isn't it? Huh? You know that the resurrected Christ eat. So we can eat. Oh, that's the part I like most. Now, <laughs> you eat, uh, you have to worry about this, uh, worry about that. Uh, uh, and usually all the good things that are nice to eat uh, are usually not healthy ones. In those days, we'll be able to eat everything. Ah, yes, it will be wonderful, wonderful. And uh, the resurrected life will be a life worth living for. Now, I just tell you a little secret that I, I am uh, uh, entertaining in my mind. You know what is heaven going to be like? You see, a lot of people think that, oh, heaven, uh, actually, we don't know much because the Bible doesn't say much. So, uh, people will say, oh, I'm going to go up there and worship God. Uh, how you worship God? Sing, la, play, harp, la. Yeah, I don't mind doing that for half a day la, for eternity la. wow <laughs> I'm sure those of you who like to sing and uh, play instrument also you don't want to do that isn't it eternity or <laughs> but it will be a life of worship but what kind of worship not necessarily singing you know playing harp but it will be a life where you will enjoy with God you know, where God's presence is with you, you know, and, uh, and you are with Him. Uh, but more than that, you know, if eternity is timeless, that means you, you, there's no time, you don't, you, there's no end, you know, no end. So you, you will live forever. It will be a place, one person says, that uh, he says eternity will be a place of unceasing joy, unceasing joy. Why? Because there's always, you know, the Bible talks about joy, eternal joy and pleasure in the presence of God. And what would that be like? You see, nowadays, one of the things about a, a sinful world or a fallen world is the, the law of decreasing returns when it comes to pleasure. The law of decreasing returns. What it means is that, for example, if you buy your first iPhone, Oh, the day you get it, you're so happy, isn't it? Young people, correct? Now, old people are the same. Wow, play with me. No. Hey, one year later, you still have that feeling, man? No law. Uh, in fact, you're thinking of the next model already. Because why? This one no longer gives you as much pleasure. It's okay, but you know, you want something more exciting. It's the same thing. You get a new car, the first brand new car. Oh, oh you're so happy. <laughs> Three years later, you close the door, so pow! <laughs> what happened to that excitement, that pleasure, that joy? Gone already, long. You need another new car. Yeah. That's why this world, you always have to come up with new things, new models, new versions, you know, upgrade, upgrade, upgrade. Because your joy and your happiness has gone down. You need, it's because there's a lot of decreasing return. Same thing, ma. Uh, your girlfriend first day, oh, I'm very happy. Oh, no. mm -hmm. You think of anything in this world. You know, first time you get the promotion. Oh, so happy. You know, I got an increase in salary. After a while, when is the next promotion? Eh? Same thing. Law of decreasing return. But in heaven, 
everything will always be as wonderful as the first time. Because in heaven, in the presence of God, there is joy forevermore. No sadness. No boredom. No sense of routine and mundaneness. It would be always joy. Every time you do something, it's, the, the, it's like the first time you do something. You know, that same kind of joy will be there. That's why heaven is worth looking forward to. Yeah? Sometimes, you know, like in, in worship, you know, in the church, when you feel that God touched you, isn't it wonderful? No matter how many times God has moved your heart or touched you or ministered to you in the past, when God touched you, that sense of joy and wonder is as wonderful as ever before, isn't it? You, you don't feel like, oh, you know, this one uh, is not as good as the last time. That, uh, you, you don't feel like that, you know, it's like, oh, you know, sometimes you are just moved to tears because the presence of God is so real. Uh, it's going to be something like that. That's why, friends, the presence of God is worth longing for. Loyalty towards God, allegiance towards God is worth it. Even though at times when we are living in this world, the road and the path to remain loyal to God is not easy. It's not easy. And one of the things about this spiritual health check is that there are some people, they have good intentions. It's not that they have bad intentions, like these Jewish Christians. They, they didn't want to do anything evil. But they just feel that, you know, they need to add something to the gospel. And that is dangerous. Like nowadays, there are some people who believe, or actually it happened quite a lot, that you must worship God only on the Sabbath day. Sabbath day, according to the Jewish uh, calculation, is on Saturday. So those of you who come to Saturday, very good. Lah. Today you come on Sunday, no good. <clears throat> but they don't look at the Bible and say that, you know, the Christians were already worshipping God on the first day of the week, which is a Sunday. And actually Paul already say, it doesn't matter what day. For us as Christians, every day is a holy day. It's not the day, it's not the ceremony, it's not the rituals. But for whatever reason, Christians, you know, in many, many centuries always fall track to this idea that, you know, in order to gain the closeness to God, you must always add to the gospel. You know, it's, I, we have nothing against uh, things that people do out of creativity, like, you know, dancing before God, la, wave flag, la, blow shofar, la, whatever they want to do, that is fine. But just don't make it part of the gospel. That means don't make it an essential part. Uh, I have the privilege to go to different churches to preach. And some small churches, they, they sort of like they are stuck with something, you know, like they want to, you know, dance and wave those kind of, uh, not actually flags. What do you call that? Huh? The tambourine, but then some people, uh, they have those flag kind of thing, you know. Huh? I don't know what they call it. Uh, you know, they dance, they wave, 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 that kind of thing. Now, in a big church like this, uh, you wave like this, never mind. But then in a shop lot, uh, and then the, the, the first row of chairs which we pastors must, as, are expected to sit, uh, you know, only a few feet away, and then they dance before you wave, wave, wave. I've been to one church, uh, the, I could see the flag uh, just passing through before my eyes. <laughs> I'm so afraid that the flag will slap me on the face. So I'll go like that. <clears throat> and I always wonder, why would you need to do that? You know, when you're, you don't have enough space. But you see, it's like an essential part. This is must, this must is be an essential part of worship. All right. Is it essential? No. But is it nice to have? Sure. It's like fashion. You know? Uh, but... And then in some places, they want to blow the shofar. Thank God in this church don't have, you know. And then, you know, if you know how to blow it properly, never mind. Some uh, don't know how to blow. Then don't have enough. You need breath on your... <laughs> oh, yeah. And the worst thing, when they blow near you, here you are worshipping God. Oh, something. I had a, f a friend who was a Jewish, uh, actually who was a, a Jew Jewish Christian who came from a family of rabbis. You know, his father was a rabbi, but then he became a Christian. And uh, he is the, he's one of those first ones who tell me, sometimes our Christians are, are more Jewish than Jews. Uh. <laughs> they do things that Jews don't even do uh, sometimes. And uh, nowadays, uh, Jewish, uh, Christians, especially in the West, uh, have all these kind of things. They want to imitate, you know, they want to celebrate the Passover, la, want to do this, want to do that, la, like the Jews, because so many people are going to Israel. Well, nothing wrong, you know, 
In fact, if you go to those Jerusalem tour, they make you eat St. Peter's fish, which is actually tilapia, and they make you pay 30 US dollar. <laughs> so stupid, but then it's part of the deal, you have to eat anyway. And then St. Peter's fish, wow, just because you call it St. Peter's fish, uh, become US dollar. <clears throat> And then some people bring back oil, water from the Dead Sea, all that. No problem, but don't make it holy. Law. <laughs> you think one drop of oil from Israel will become something special? You know, friends, all those kind of things are, are like, you know, you want to play with it, play with it. But it's not the gospel. It's not the gospel. And the worst thing is, some of us, we feel that, you know, it's like something holy already. You know, something, you know, is going to have spiritual power. Where got spiritual power? It's the same thing nowadays that uh, some people, when you pray for them, they fall. In some churches, they feel that when pastor pray for them, they must fall one. <laughs> if they don't fall, uh, the spirit is not there. So some of them actually cannot fall. So like... <laughs> 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 Friends, friends, <laughs> Actually, you know, yes, when the, sometimes when people pray and then uh, the Spirit touch you and then pong you fall, yes, it's true. But it's not a requirement. It's not a requirement. All right? Those are things that sometimes happen. Some the, there are other people who ask me, Pastor, why is it that when Pastor pray for them, they fall? Uh, I say, actually, I also don't know why. <laughs> they say, no, 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 it's because the Spirit touched them. I say, yes, that is true, but touch them in what way? Do you know? In my experience, uh, people, when they have something wrong with them, either demons or even spiritual problem, when sometimes people, they are prayed for, they will fall. So falling doesn't mean a good thing, you know. <clears throat> it means something wrong with you. But, <laughs> no la, no la, no la. There's, there's the other aspect. And that is, there are people, including pastors, that when sometimes the Spirit of God touch you, you also fall. So falling doesn't mean good or bad. It, it can be anything. All right? But there are some of us who never fall. I'm one of those who don't fall. My f the reason is because I just cannot fall. What to do? <laughs> you know, when I was in Australia, you know, that was already, I was already a pastor, and at that time I went to Australia to study, and I felt that, hey, after so many years, I never fall. I would like to experience how to fall. I mean, how it feels like to fall. So, uh, you know, then there was a pastor that prayed for us. I went out and I prayed for, and then, I felt that, wow, well, I looked behind first. Wow, well, there was two Australian men, you know, quite big size. So I was thinking, huh, should be able to tahan my weight, you know. <laughs> so I was thinking, okay, right, this time try. Right? Oh, pray, pray, pray. Oh, but actually, it was not real, right? so no luck. <coughs> but after that, I never fall again. But I'm still looking for the day that I will fall, really fall. Haven't, haven't happened yet, you know. My father is worse, uh, when he became a Christian, you see, he used to learn Kung Fu, you know, when he was young. So when he became a Christian, he also see people falling left and right, and he also cannot fall. I think I got it from him. And the worst thing is that he doesn't like people to press him, you know, like, <clears throat> so when anybody press him, uh, his Kung Fu instinct all come out, and he become like Wang Fei Hong. Hmm? <laughs> he said, I will put, he automatically put one leg behind. You know, when you put your one leg behind, you automatically steady yourself, isn't it? Isn't it? How to fall? Like that, cannot fall. Mm. <laughs> and because he used to learn Kung Fu, no matter how hard you press, mm. <laughs> <laughs> so one day he came to me. He said, you know, I cannot fall. I want to do. I said, it's okay. La. Don't fall. La. Don't fall. No need to fall. My father is very funny. <laughs> Friends, what is, you know, spirituality? What is gospel? You just believe in Jesus. That's all, huh? You believe in Jesus, give your heart to Jesus, worship Jesus, and uh, that is what it means. All the other thing is, no problem, you know, it's like, you know, fashion in the marketplace. You like to hold, you know, have your hair short, punk look, what look, what look, it doesn't matter, but it's not going to make you. You are not that. It's just part of the accessories of life, all right? And if it happens to you, wonderful, all right? Oh, you know, the Lord touched me, I fall, wonderful. You know, the presence of the Lord is there, wonderful. But it's not essential. I was just in a church a few weeks ago. The pastor was saying to me, hi, ah, you some of these people. There was one lady who came to my church, you know, some, one time, and she wanted to dance. She said the spirit of the Lord is upon her, and she wanted to dance like David danced. And dance. But the thing is that she wanted to dance in front of the church. 
So it was causing a distraction. So in the end, the pastor says, you want to dance, okay, I won't restrict you, but maybe at the corner there, at the place there, section closer, just that, you know, you can dance. Just, no, I must dance in front. So the pastor said, no, we cannot allow you to dance in front. So she felt this church not spiritual. She left the church. The pastor said, thank God she left the church. <laughs> Anything that distracts us from Jesus Christ is not of God. Same thing, even circumcision. You know, circumcision is a holy thing, you know, a seal uh, given by God to Abraham. It's not uh, something that's bad, you know, it's a holy thing. But when it comes to Jesus Christ, no, no deal. That's why Paul was so upset. Today, anything that takes our attention away from faith in Christ is not of God. We do not accept. You want to play with it, we, uh, it's okay. That's why Paul will even say, you know, actually in other places he say, we have nothing against circumcision. If you are already circumcised, it's fine. And if you want to get circumcised, it's fine. But don't make it as part of your salvation. Don't make it as part of your salvation. Mm. The other thing in this letter that Paul says is that something that he actually talks about his own personal testimony, but from there, actually it helps us to gain an insight into what life is really like, you know, how, how to look at your life. Because we talk about how do you know how healthy you are spiritually. Paul says that God set him apart from birth in verse 15 in order for him to preach, to, to commission him to preach to the Gentiles. The fact that Paul talks about the, the idea that God actually set people apart from birth, is it only just relating to Paul? You mean only God set apart Paul? God doesn't set apart anybody? Or is Paul actually saying that, that, that actually God does set people apart to do his work? In the book of Corinthians, he tells people that to remain in whatever situation you are, in the situation that God has assigned to you, has put you in. Which means that what Paul is saying is that in our life, who we are, at that time he was talking about, you know, even he, he says that, have, are you a slave? Do not seek to be free. But of course, if you can be free, it's okay. He's actually talking about the, your, your, your role or even actually your, 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 the situation you find yourself. Like slaves, they, they have been sold and now they are slaves for life. It can also mean as job to, to us because today we are not talking about slaves. We are talking about, you know, most of us spend most of our time in a job. Have you ever thought of the fact that actually God had set you apart to commission you to be in a certain situation, a certain role? Now, for us, it's actually hard to believe. Now, you, of course, if you're CEO of a company, you don't mind, uh, God set me apart from birth to be a CEO of this international company. Mm. God set me apart from birth to be the one of the great lawyers, you know. But God set me apart from birth to be a garbage collector. God set me apart from birth, you know, to be just an uh, ordinary clerk that cannot get promotion. Huh? What if you are just a very ordinary person <clears throat> and, uh, you know, compared to a lot of people, you are really nowhere? How do you relate this God has set me apart kind of a thing from birth? But, you know, I'm grateful to Paul. Because when he talked about this, he actually referred to slaves. Can a garbage collector be worse than a slave? Can a clerk be worse than a slave? No, ma. And yet you wonder, God, if you love us so much, why, why would you assign us to such a lowly role, such an unfortunate role in life? Friends, this is where you need to see a bigger picture, and that is we don't live in a good world. In fact, the book of Galatians says God has come to rescue us from an evil age. This is an evil world. Because of sin, a lot of things are not what it should be. The gap between the rich and the poor are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Politicians promise, wipe out poverty in the year. <laughs> you can laugh at their face. It will never happen. Creating a, a just and a clean society. Uh, Germany, not too bad. La. Singapore, also okay. La. But how many other countries? I don't know. La. Maybe Switzerland, those kind of places. I don't know. I haven't been those places. Germany, I've been there. 
looks pretty good. In fact, I have a German friend, a uh, Christian, who says, you know, I had a hard time adjusting to life in Malaysia. He's actually, he was, he's now a missionary here. He says that in Germany, when we go to any government departments and we cannot get our rights, we demand our rights. Because we will tell the officers there and the, the, whoever is working there, this is my right. And then the officers, mm -hmm. he said, here in Malaysia, if you argue this is my right, nobody listen to you. <laughs> I said, you should be grateful they didn't kick you out. <laughs> Some countries have, it, have a better system than ours, but still, it is still a corrupt system. Just that the level of corruption is much, much lower. This is an evil age, and because of that, even us, you know, because of the sin that came and the decay that came to our bodies, some people are born with handicaps. It's not that God wants them to be born with handicaps. Some people, because of the, the, the genes in us, the, the, the genetic part of us, is all getting worse and worse. That's why there are so many diseases, because the whole body is breaking down. One generation after a generation, things are getting bad. And same way, in this world, there are so many injustices, so many things that are wrong. And so when we come into this world, uh, we, we face all these challenges. And some of us, when we are born, you know, not so smart and all that, uh, we are just not able to make it to the top. But what the gospel tells us is that because of the hope and the work of Christ for us, that even though in this world we are limited by the conditions, the situations that we find ourselves in, like if I'm not so smart, I just, I'm a garbage collector, okay? And I'm limited because I'm not smart enough. Or I'm limited because I don't have the opportunities, I don't have the right connections, I don't know the right people, I didn't come from a rich family. Uh, because of all those limitations, I am now stuck in this position. I cannot go higher. I can't even get out, find a, uh, another job, let's say. But the gospel of Christ is to let us know that just because you are in that so-called lowly role, insignificant position in life, you are an important person in the eyes of God because Jesus died for you. Because God considered you worthy enough for him to love you. Even if everybody tells you you are a nobody, God says, in my eyes, I love you. If I, the God who created heavens and earth, says that you are a somebody, you are a somebody. And so for us, it is up to us to decide who do we believe. Life of faith is belief. Do I believe in what I hear from people who tell me I'm a nobody? Or I believe God who tells me I'm a child of God. Friends, how do you keep yourself healthy spiritually? choose to believe God, not only just on the day you receive Jesus, oh, I believe Jesus, but it's actually an everyday thing. Believing in how God looks at us, how God sees us, believing that we should use the, the, the perspective of God to look at the world, that is faith. It's all belief. Because people will say, that, why do you want to give your money in tithes and offerings? So stupid. Why do we do that? Because we believe that God says that we should give and when we give, we will receive. We believe that in giving, we are acknowledging God. And that is why, even for slaves, Paul says, if you can be free, yes, by all means. It's like, you know, for all of us, if you can get a better job, why not? If you can get a better position in life, why not? But if you can't, if there's no way out, Paul says, don't give up. Don't give up, you know. But rather remain as you are, and not remain with grudgingness, with anger, you know, all right, with envy and with bitterness. No, no. But remain knowing that you are a child of God and remain confident in that. Knowing that before God, your word comes, your prayers count. Knowing that before God, what you think, what you say counts. Do you know that being saved means that God would listen to your words? that your word before God counts. That's what prayer is all about. You cry out to God, God listens to you, and God answers your prayer. Your word before God counts. Your thoughts before God counts. Nobody may listen to what you say.
but God will listen to what you say. And all of this is by believing in Jesus. That's why the life of faith is actually believing every day. And not only just, oh, on the day you receive Christ. It's every day, do you know who you are? Do you know what God says of you? Do you know how God wants you to look at the world? Do you know how God wants you to look at life? If you understand that you have been set apart from birth to serve Him wherever you are, then you look at your situation differently. If you are a boss, have you looked at your workers and asked yourself, God, what do you want me, what kind of a role you want me to play here? How do you want me to serve you here? Not by like telling you just now, you know, oh boss, you cannot get angry. No. It's like, how do you show people that when they do wrong, yes, you can be upset with them, but you are going to be fair. And that you will also be as strict with them as with yourself. You set an example. It's the same thing if you are a parent. Some Christians, you know, long ago used to believe that when you love your children, you should not discipline them. Then your children become, you know, terrifying Tyrants, no, when they grow up. Uh, but how do you discipline in a way that is fair? I've seen Christian parents, you know, reacting the same way as non-Christian parents because they don't understand that what being a Christian really is like. Uh, I've ch- seen children, you know, they come to your place and they keep jumping on your sofa, leather sofa. Bum, 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 All right. And then the mother and father say nothing. Or sometimes the mother will say, don't do that lah. Ay, ay, you spoil people so far lah. Ah, then they start talking. And then the children go, bum, 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 bum. Then after another five minutes, ay, ay, I told you already, don't do that lah. Then they go, bum, 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 bum. I was thinking, why don't you just go there and grab your child and say, you sit here, don't do that. If you do that, when you go home, I'll give you a spanking. Why don't you mean what you say? You know, actually, you know why the child don't listen? Because the child already know from experience that you don't mean what you say. So they are waiting for you to scream. Ah, then they know, ah, that's the last straw that will break the camel's back. Then they will stop. What are we telling our children? Our word doesn't count. When I tell you stop, actually, it doesn't really mean it. One, I hope you will stop. No, no. Does your word mean what you say? If you have been set apart from birth to be a parent of this child, how do you think you should carry out that role? How do you give your best to that role? How do you help the child to understand what is right and wrong? Have you think about it? That is also a role. If you are a student, it's the same thing. You may not be the smartest, but you develop your character by doing your best. Because you see, ultimately in this life, God wants us to develop our inner being, our character. You cannot change the outside, but you can change the inside. Do you know that the slaves, the black slaves of America, they develop a strong tradition of spirituality, very strong, but they were slaves. Many of them die, live as slaves, die as slaves. They never see freedom. But in spite of them, they are very spiritual. You know why? Because inside of them, they know they are not slaves. That even when they have out a physical masters, the one who control them is not this, just this human being, which is God. That's why they become holy and strong inside. And friends, it's the same way for many of us. You may not be able to change your outward situation, but you can become strong inside. So that one day when you meet Jesus face to face, you will be someone that God will say, I will give you cities to rule because you are a prince, you are a queen. Because that is what you have become inside. And that is why everywhere we are, whatever we do, whatever your role, whether it be student or business person or employee, you do your best. Why? Not because of your lecturer, not because of your boss, not because of your customers. No, no, no. We do our best because of the fact that we are the children of God. Why do we not do sleep short work? Because how can I let God see me do sleep short work? Why am I not lazy? Because I don't want God to see a lazy person in me. Why do I, 
you know, refrain from dishonesty because God sees what I do. That's why, let's say, you are a wonton me seller. You sell wonton me. How do you be a wonton me seller that honors God? You know, so God assigned my role in life at birth to be a wonton me seller. Huh? Wonton me seller, ah? But what's wrong with you, wonton me seller? I will make sure the oil I use is not, are not those oil that actually hurt people, rec bad recycled oil. All right. I will not put anything in my soup that is actually harmful for people's health. Why? Because I'm a Christian. Because God gave me a role here. My role is I would be the best I can in whatever role. I will do the best. If we understand that, then you find that your life perspective will change. Because if not, many Christians feel trapped. You know, those full gospel businessmen kind of a fellowship is wonderful. But it is wonderful if those people can get connect. you know, people go there, get connections, and then get connections for business and do better business. It's okay too. But what if you go there and you find that you can't change, you, you can't do better? Your business is like that, small, small, you know, insignificant, insignificant. And then you have all these speakers that come and tell you, you know, how successful you be, can be, you know, how God can bless your business, how God can do this for you. And then your people will come for testimony and say that, you know, from this small thing, you know, then God, bring you, then all of a sudden, you know, I become rich and all that kind of thing. And then you're wondering, why is it not happening to me? Ah? Huh? Why? Ah? Why, why God answer his prayer, don't answer mine? Ah? That's where then you get all the wrong ideas. But if you read the scriptures, you will find that, Hey, to be assigned a role, a situation in life by God, to be set apart, means that wherever you are, you need to see how God can help you to see your own significance and see your own reality. That your reality is not just contained in what you see. Just as Adam and Eve cannot see physical reality, but the real, spiritual reality is already there. And in the same way, one day you and I, we are going to have a resurrected body. Is your character fit for a resurrected body with God? A life of eternity, eternal happiness. Oh, I have to look at this, 11.55. <clears throat> okay, it's time to end, but let me just end with this. A life that is spiritually healthy is a life that is transformed. Actually, everything that I said just now, is tied to this. Paul changed from a persecutor of the church to become somebody who will preach the gospel. Actually, Paul was already a very good man before he became a Christian. He says in the book of Philippians that when he was a person, a, a Pharisee, he actually followed the law so perfectly, he says that with regard to the law, I am blameless. How many people can say that? That means he kept the law of God so perfectly, he never do anything wrong. And yet, he realized that after you become a Christian, your life has to be transformed. The transformation for Paul was that he, he understand one fact, and that is, no matter how zealous you are for God, or how much you think you love God, or how much you think you know about God, if you hurt people, that is wrong. He used to persecute the church, send people to prison, even if you die, he doesn't care, because he felt that you know, he was doing it for God. Just like today, there are some religions who feel that they can kill you and do it in the name of God. And they think that they are doing it for God. Paul realized that you can't. That's why after he became a Christian, he realized that the important thing is to seek the well-being of others. Not to hurt others. You look at his letters, he oftentimes says, you, we shouldn't do anything to hurt people, especially those in, the, in, in, in Christ. But all the more, you shouldn't go out and hurt people. A life that is transformed is a life that understands that Jesus did not come into this world to bring hurts, to bring destruction. The devil come to bring hurt and destruction. Jesus does not. Which means that when we look at our life after we are saved, does my life hurt people? Does the thing, do the things that I do bring harm to people? If it does, no matter how good the profit margin is, no matter how 
what advantages it brings to us, it is wrong. It is wrong. My sister used to work in a bank in Malaysia. Now she's in the U.S. Um, when she was here in Malaysia, you know, occasionally I would try to talk to her about Christ. And uh, she would then tell me, she said, you know, sis, um, I have a bank manager, my superior, um, whom I work directly with. And he has a Bible at the corner of his desk so that everybody would know that he is a Christian. And um, you know how he treats us? You know, he has his group of pets whereby, you know, the people that he bring along with him from another bank, and uh, those are very close to him. When he gives us work, you know, we will have to work very hard. His people work less hard. But when it comes to bonuses, in some banks, they distribute bonuses by uh, giving the discretion to the head. Uh, it is the head who decides how much the worker will get. Okay? So it is up to this manager to distribute the amount of bonuses among his staff, you know, who will get the better one, who will get a bigger portion and all that. And my sister says that his pets get the bigger portion. We, we work very, very hard. We hardly get anything. And then because when it comes to presentation of the, the results and the, the, the papers, it is the bank manager that gets it. So it is up to him whether to give us credit or not. He says some of those things, we are the ones who do it, but we never get any credit because he never mentioned our names. And, he say, and she said, and he has a Bible at the corner of his desk. So I say, ah, oh. I say, yeah, lah, some Christians. Uh. <laughs> I mean, how do witness like that? Uh, when they tell you the, the kind of Christians that they meet, so all you can do is pray for them. I thank God today my sister is a Christian, love God very, very much. Uh, it's just amazing the way that she prays God and love God and uh, her understanding of the truth of God is really amazing. And sometimes I think back to the time when, you know, she used those words and tell me, I also have friends who are Christian. It's like, you know, two different persons. You know, God is merciful and wonderful. But friends, ultimately, bottom line is, when we are out there, does our life bring the gospel to people? Sometimes bringing the gospel is not like just talking. No point talking. All right? Like someone here in the church, eh, Katrina, who brought me from the airport, says that she has co one colleague who would like to say, praise the Lord, thank you, Jesus, you know, all the Christian jargon. But then among the other colleagues, they think that she's dishonest. They don't like her. Just imagine a Christian, they keep talking about Jesus, 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 and then dishonest in your dealings. Paul shows us it's not just a good life, it's a transformed life. Friends, how do you know how healthy we are? Well, is my life a life that brings blessing to people? A life that people can say, wow, you know, this is a responsible person. This is a person that if I want to trust somebody, I would trust her. You know, if there's somebody, you know, that I know I can depend on who's reliable, I will trust him. Or, they would say that, yeah, he may not be very smart, but, you know, he's absolutely reliable. That is what being a Christian is all about. Because the good news of Jesus Christ is about somebody who has met with God. How do we let people know we have met with the God of heaven and earth? Let's arise as we pray today. Can the worship team come? We're going to sing the song, You Are Forever in My Life. I think that's a good song. And as we sing that, it is not just to confess that God is with us, but it is also a reminder that if God is with us, are we with Him? Friends, today, as we look at our own lives, it will be a good time to see where are our priorities, where is our focus. What are we laboring, working so hard for? Is there something that you want so badly? So badly to the point that you have forgotten what is the most important thing that we should desire for. Desiring for things in this world is not wrong. Wanting things in this world is not wrong. 
But if we want it so badly that we are willing to do things that we know are not pleasing to God's eyes, then something is wrong. Or if we look at our lives and we are not understanding correctly who we are in Christ, or sometimes even forget the point that being a child of God, what it really means, and your head is bowed low, your sense of inferiority is causing you to react and respond in ways that are unhealthy. Today, you need to see yourself again in Christ Jesus. See this God, not just a loving God, but a God who is awesome and mighty, in fact, terrifying. And yet this God has chosen you to be his child. And if that is the case, why are we still ashamed? Why are we still inferior? If we are struggling with issues of anger, of conflict, we also need to look at those issues and ask ourselves, are those things worth fighting for? Will, fight, will I become somebody that God is displeased with if I continue to fight for those things? Or is there wisdom required in the way the battle is carried out? Whereby we seek righteousness, we seek fairness, but not to the point of hurting people. The Bible says love covers a multitude of sins. It does not mean we condone sin. But it does mean that we need to let go of certain things. And that if things can be forgiven, overlooked, then we should do so. Just as God does not keep a record of our wrongs, we do not keep a record of the wrongs of others. Today, God is inviting us to see Him, see how great His love is for us, and inviting us to be like Him, to walk with Him, walk with His help, walk in His grace. He is a gracious God, and God is saying to each of us, let my graciousness come upon you and that we learn to be people of grace. We learn to be people of graciousness. You are forever in my life. 